Hello Godot.com 2021 and welcome to this Godot multiplayer talk. I'm Stefan and I'm the creator and tutor behind the Game Development Center YouTube channel. I've created a Godot multiplayer tutorial series which currently has 18 episodes with over 6 hours of recorded lessons. I'm telling you that because I want to set some expectations and define some goals here. Obviously, I can't put six hours of tutorial content into 20 minutes and teach you how to make a multiplayer game. Sorry. What I can do though is set with you some goals that I think will be really good for this talk and will be very beneficial to you. I have two goals with this talk. My first goal is that when you have watched this talk, you'll have a much better understanding of the impact of a multiplayer feature on your game development project. The considerations that go into it the complexity that comes with it and the time that it will require. This will hopefully help you ask the question if you are ready and it will help you plan the game development process of that project much better. Now my second goal is to make sure that you start asking better questions. That may sound a little bit weird, but I'm bombarded with questions after I started my multiplayer series on my YouTube channel, my Discord, my email. And a lot of these questions are really good, but some questions you can just sort of sense that people don't really know what multiplayer is yet. And that makes it really hard to find good answers. How are you going to find an answer to your question if you don't even know what to type into the Google search bar? So, with this talk, I hope that you have a better understanding of network architecture and various terminology related to multiplayer games. That way, you know how to ask better questions, and there's no doubt that better questions result in better answers. With the goals out of the way, let's dive in. Let's first distinguish between three different multiplayer types. We have our peer-to-peer -peer networks, our player-hosted server networks, and our dedicated server networks. In a peer-to-peer -peer network, also called serverless network, all the peers connect straight to each other. There's no server in between there, making your network architecture considerably less complex. At the same time, the problem is that there's no server. And because there's no server, there's nothing that can have absolute authority. It's called peer-to-peer -peer because the peers connect straight to each other, but a peer is also a synonym for equal, and all the players in the network are equal. Therefore, there's no authority that can decide when two peers cannot agree with each other what the actual result or the actual state of an object should be. That's the reason why having more players in your peer-to-peer -peer network makes it increasingly, exponentially more complex. You often see a maximum player count of six to eight players, and this version, this peer-to-peer -peer kind of network, lends itself best for turn-based games where the time step is deterministic and you don't have all these synchronization problems. Now, I'm not going to be talking about peer-to-peer -peer networks in this talk, and I don't even talk about it in my tutorial series. I only talk about dedicated server. Dedicated server networks is where the publisher or the game developer is hosting, maintaining, and monitoring the servers. Think your World of Warcraft, PUBG, and those kind of games. Now, in between these two variants, we have the player-hosted server. This is your Minecraft kind of server, where you have your game menu when you're in your game. You can host a room or host a server. You give some friends your IP address and they can log in. This is sometimes, in my opinion, wrongly called peer-to-peer. -peer. It is not peer-to-peer -peer because all peers are being connected through a server. That server might be hosted by one of the peers, but it's not peer-to-peer. -peer. Also, like I said earlier, peer is a synonym for equal. And the fact that one player is the host of the game means automatically that these peers are not equal anymore. So, I prefer to use the term player-hosted server, as that much better indicates what it actually is. And anybody in the game industry, when you talk about player-hosted server, knows exactly what you're talking about, making your questions better to understand, in case you're asking your questions somewhere on a Reddit or a Discord. Now with that terminology out of the way, I'm going to be talking in this talk about dedicated server networks. That means the kind of server that you host and it can really scale up to thousands of players. What I'm going to be telling you and what I'm going to be showing you does not apply in the slightest sense to peer-to-peer -peer networks. However, a lot of it does apply to the player-hosted version. There are some small changes left and right that I'm sure you'll be able to figure out by yourself. I don't have the time to call all of those little nuances out, so I'm just going to be talking about dedicated multiplayer networks. So we're going to be talking about dedicated server networks through the lens of one topic, network architecture, and three different examples. 
player movement and how we sync it across the network, player attacking and how we can make sure that the server does server side coalition verifications to ensure the player cannot exploit the game. And lastly, we want to have a look at how we actually loot an item from a chest. Sounds pretty easy, but there's a good example of how you need to structure your data and communicate data between client and server to make sure, again, that that player cannot exploit. So let's first talk about our network architecture. I'm sorry to be again the bringer of bad news, but there is no one size fits all, pick it off of the shell and implement it kind of solution. Every game that you and I love playing has a carefully designed and implemented network architecture for the particular needs of that particular game. That means that you are going to be, have to be designing some network architecture for your own game. That's challenge number one. We can agree, however, on a number of elements that a network architecture generally consists of. So let's start with our clients. Our clients are going to be connecting to our gateway. Our gateway functions as an access point to our authentication server. We do not want to have a direct connection between client and authentication server for security reasons. Now, this is the first time and simultaneously last time that I'm going to be mentioning security because there's another talk here at go.com that goes specifically into that topic. I suggest you watch that one too. Now, once the player has been successfully authenticated, that signal will come back to the client and then the client can connect straight to the game server. We want that connection between client and game server to be direct so that the latency is as low as possible because that will make everybody happy. In case of a global network deployment, we tend to see a gateway and a couple of servers as a minimum per geographical area in the world. Think East and West Coast US, Europe, Singapore, South Africa, and one or two locations in Latin America. This is necessary to keep the latency as low as possible. And this is the reason why you're traveling the world on your holiday destinations, and you brought your favorite multiplayer game on your phone, that once you're logged in to hotel Wi-Fi, you see completely different people, you can sometimes not even find your own guild, and chat is flooded with a language you don't understand. Suddenly, you're connected to a different gateway and to different game servers, based on your geographical location. Now, some game developers dream of breaking this barrier to connect everybody up together globally. However, unless you're a very smart cookie, the speed of light remains the speed of light and you're not gonna tell Einstein that he was wrong. All those signals, they have to travel the fibers that are laid down on the ocean floor, passing through dozens of switches. And all of that traveling and all of that switching is increasing the latency. And that's why connecting everybody up globally is a very bad idea because the latency differences between the various players in a game are simply going to make a bad player experience for everybody involved. Now that we have looked at the general network architecture, we should also zoom in on the game servers and its configuration. Various options are available to us that will impact both the players and us as developers alike. For the players, it will determine the way with which they'll be able to interact with the world and also the extent with which they'll be able to interact with the rest of the player base. Some configurations only allow communication and interaction with other players on the same server that have their account on that particular server, while other configurations allow interaction and communication across all servers with the entire player base. From the developer's perspective, the choice of server configuration can have an impact on the difficulty with which it is to manage, the extent with which it has to be monitored, and some server configurations simply require you to have beefier hardware. More beefier hardware means more dollars to spend on that hardware, and that will have an impact on the budget of your game. Regretfully, I don't have time in this talk to go over all these different server configurations. Know that they are highly customized for the particular game that they were designed for. Maybe you can find some relief in the fact that you don't actually need to have this server configuration set in stone at the beginning of your multiplayer project. You can easily develop the game, go through the first couple of alpha tests and maybe even a close beta test with just one server. That gives you more than enough time to research this topic and come up with a server configuration that fits your particular game. All right, I think that is probably enough talk about network architecture. Let's get into these three examples. The first one being our player synchronization across multiple clients. For this, we are going to be needing our clients, of course, 
and our server. In this case, we can leave out gateways and authentication servers and all the other stuff about network. That's, that's all the past now. Because once the player has been authenticated, it connects directly to that game server. And only these two become important to us. So how do we do this? We start this off on the client side. The client needs to inform the server what its movement is so that the server can distribute that movement across all peers in the network. We have two options available for that client to communicate to the server. We can either send the input data, that will be move forward, move backward, left and right, or we can send the positional data, being a vector 2 or a vector 3. There are pros and cons to both of these methods. Let's go into that a tiny bit as it's a very often heard question when people start out with multiplayer. When we're updating the server on player movement, we use unreliable communication protocols to keep the latency down. That comes at a disadvantage of the possibility of packet loss. With a packet lost, the server cannot process that information. If we use the player input in our movement update, that means that some of these updates can get lost on the internet and thus not processed by the server. In some games, this doesn't have to be a negative consequence. However, in competitive games, especially those in the spatial dimension, like a racing game, that can have a disastrous effect on player experience. Imagine two players in a racing game with exactly the same car, exactly the same stats. Now maybe one of these players has a slightly more reliable connection to your game server. Maybe he lives physically closer to the data center your server is housed in, or maybe he uses a different internet provider. That player will receive less packet loss and thus the server is going to receive more of its packets and process more of its input packets. That means in the data that these two players are equally fast, but in the game, the more reliably connected player will move faster, breaking the competitiveness in your game. We can counter this by giving all the input that's being sent from the client to the server an ID and have the server check if all the IDs were received and if it misses one, re-request it from the client. That means, of course, that the client will need to retain a history of the input it sent. You can quickly see how this protocol starts to become more complex. The advantage, though, is that it's really difficult to cheat. The player, the client, is only sending, hey, I move forward, and the server will determine with what speed. That is the opposite for our alternative movement method of sending positional data, vector 2s or vector 3s. In that case, the player could go into the source files, change variables like speed or max speed, and calculations are being made by the client based on these changed variables to determine new position. That position is sent to the server, and suddenly our player is moving much faster. Of course, we can counter this on the server by taking, at random times, a random number of players, take two signals, determine the time between these signals, and determine the distance traveled by these signals. And we can calculate, based on variables known by the server, if that input is valid. And if that is invalid, we can warn the player, kick the player, ban the player, whatever we want. This last method of positional data is less complex. And because it's less complex, I usually advise this method for developers that start out with multiplayer for the very first time. Now, on top of that, it is my experience that this method requires a little bit less computational power from your server, which could impact your budget positively, if ever so slightly. Right, that is probably going to be the last time that I'm going to have time to go into some of these considerations with this much depth. So let's continue with the player movement synchronization across our network. So we're going to start on our client. Our client sends out its positional data 60 times per second to the server. On top of that, the client will also do its local processing of the input. In other words, the client is going to predict what the server will determine will happen. That will make sure that the responsiveness of the input will feel snappy for the player. It will feel good. It will feel like the game responds immediately. So with that done, the server has its signals, but the server is not going to straight up process these. Remember, the client sends these signals out 60 times per second. That means that 100 connected players is 6,000 of these positional data inputs per second. If we have to process all of that input individually on the server, we're quickly overloading the server with more than would be required for smooth movement. No, instead, these signals are going to be collected in an input collection or a player state collection, and we'll process that collection on a tick time of the server. 
A good tick time for a server is generally 20 times per second. So 20 times per second, we're going to be taking a look at what input we have received in the last 50 milliseconds, and we'll process that into a world state. If the server is responsible for the whole world, we could call it a chunk state if the server is responsible for a chunk of the map, or in some cases, we also call it a snapshot. Now, once we have this world state or snapshot, the server will send out that snapshot to all the pairs in the network where it will be stored in a buffer. Again, we don't straight up process this so that we have the ability to interpolate, extrapolate, and we're going to be rubber banding any deviations that may come as a result of the client side prediction that we did earlier. This talk is too short to go into all these details. So I'm gonna leave out extrapolation and rubber banding of deviations, thereby giving us a little bit more time to look at interpolation and why it is so important. This is best illustrated if we have a look first what would happen if we don't buffer and don't interpolate. So this situation pretty much happens continuously. The client needs to render the world. And let's say that the clock in the network is at 10 seconds and 200 milliseconds. Now let's say that the last snapshot was received at 10 seconds, 170 milliseconds. That means that the client expects the next snapshot in 20 milliseconds, as it receives one about every 50 milliseconds. However, it doesn't know that snapshot yet, so it doesn't really know where the players currently are. The only thing it knows is where the players were 30 milliseconds ago, and the best thing that I can do is render them in that location. That is undesirable, because that would mean that we update our players only 20 times per second, and that is too little for good fluid movement. With interpolation, we're not going to render the time as it is now, not at 10 seconds, 200 milliseconds. Instead, we'll render the world with an offset, for example, 100 milliseconds. And by buffering our world state into a collection, we now have the availability of both world states in the past as well as world states in the future. Now we can interpolate the position property of all players in those world states and we can calculate with a lot of precision pretty much where every single player should have been on every single millisecond of the timeline. Now we of course don't want to update that often, that would mean a thousand frames per second, but we can basically upgrade our 20 frames per second of our server snapshots to a more respectable 60 frames per second on the client side. That is a high level overview of a player synchronization function across a multiplayer game network. There is of course a lot more details that I could go into, but as we set some expectations at the beginning of this talk, I think I set you up with a broad understanding of the concept and the right terminology to start asking questions yourself and digging deeper into this material. Let's move on to the next scenario I wanna talk about, a player attacking. When a player attacks something else on the world, whether it be another player or an NPC, we want as many variables that go into the calculation of that attack to come from the server. The attack damage that a player can do based on its stats, the defense stat or the resistance stat of whatever was attacked, the starting HP and the resulting HP, we all want that data to come from the server. That's pretty much a given. What is a particularly interesting topic is the coalition data. Does the player hit or miss? If we let it up for the player or the client to make that decision, we could hack the code and we could tell the server that we are attacking pretty much every entity in sight or even on the map like 60 times per second. That's a great way to power level for the player, but it's probably not what you envisioned when it comes to the balancing of your game. So we want the server to verify or even we want the server to determine whether a collision actually took place. So the server is going to need the spatial data of the coalition to do those calculations. That means that we need to give our server a map. But we don't want our server to be burdened by 3D models and textures and sprite sheets and all that other stuff. That would just be burdening the server for nothing. I mean, nobody's going to be looking at the server. Nobody is playing on the server. It's probably going to be in a, in a no window mode, so you don't even see it. So we want to extract our data from our original map into a server side map that usually only consists of collision data. So let's follow a projectile attack together from the moment that the player makes it, signaling the server, processing that attack on the server, and then back to all the clients on the network. 
We start off with that one attack and we want our players to have a responsive and snappy experience. So we immediately play the attack animation and we spawn in the projectile, whether that's a 2D sprite sheet or a 3D model. At the same time, we are signaling the server that we have attacked and we need to send a couple of variables with that signal. We need a timestamp of when the attack actually took place so we can make sure everything stays synchronized. We need a position where the attack was made from, a vector in which direction that attack is being made, and possibly based on the circumstances and the way that your projectiles work, you need some more information as well. I'll leave it up to your specific game design. The server is going to be receiving that attack and that server needs to be processing the attack. It needs to do two things. First of all, it needs to spawn in a coalition version of that projectile into its own server coalition map. At the same time, we also want to straight away signal all the clients in the network that a new attack has been made by a player. And we want to make sure that all the clients in the network at the right time, based on that timestamp, surrender in that projectile into the world. Now, now that everybody has the projectile, the player, all the other players and the server, it is up to the server to decide what happens next. Is the collision hitting anything or is it a miss? And if it hits, it will have to extract all the variables that it knows from the player, the attack, any modifiers, magical properties, and needs to take any stats from maybe the NPC that we're hitting, the defense, the resistance, some magical resistance, and then calculate what the new HP of that entity is going to be. Then, in case this was indeed an NPC, the NPCs are also communicated in our world state, in our snapshot. So simply by deducting the health of the NPC, in the next snapshot that's going to be sent out to all the players, we'll be updating the health bar of the NPC so that everybody can see that the health bar was attacked. Okay, so that's a pretty high level overview of how an attack in a multiplayer game can work and the various elements that you'll have to take into account when you start planning your project. Now, let's move on to the third and last item that I want to discuss with you today. It's a pretty short one, but it's an important one for illustration. How do we loot a chest? The loot chest makes for an interesting topic because there's no doubt among you are developers that are not looking to make a multiplayer game where players can see each other and interact with each other and the world needs to be synchronized. Maybe you want to make a clicker game that you know, requires you to harvest and plant some crops. In this case, you don't have snapshots and world states that need to be synchronized, but you do have a lot of data that needs to be interchanged between the client and the server. So the loot chest is a good example to illustrate how something like that could work and how something like that could go wrong. So let's have a look at that. Now, how that chest exactly gets into the world is not massively important for this illustration, but let's go over it real fast. Usually the server has a function that spawns these chests in. It knows how many chests are allowed to be in any given location. It will have a chest spawn timer to spawn in new chests and it will spawn these chests in at a random location or predetermined locations from which it will randomly select. Now once we have a chest spawning in, that signal will go out to all the clients so they can display it in the world and the player can walk up to it and loot it. The moment that a player loots it, that is a signal that goes from the client to the server, says like, hey, I want to know the loot of chest number and then an ID number of that chest, let's say chest number 46, and the server will reply to the client, say like, well, you have these seven items. Okay, so far, so good. Now let's say that the player sees in this chest a common sword, and it's like, you know what, a common sword is not so special, it's called common for a reason. How about, no, I want a legendary sword of input fancy name. And instead of saying, I looted a common sword, it will say, you know what, server, I've looted a legendary sword of input fancy name. This is, of course, very exploit sensitive because that are actually changes that a player could make in the code of the game. Instead of calling to the server the exact item that was in the chest, simply overriding it with a hard-coded um, item name will then put that item in your inventory. If you code your game like that, of course, I'm here to tell you that you probably shouldn't. You should never trust the client. Just a moment ago, we talked about the player attack and we also didn't trust the client to determine the collision detection for us. 
we left it up to the server. And just like that, we don't want to trust the client to tell the server the particular item that it has been looting. We don't want the information that flows from the client to the server to be deterministic. We only want to communicate through references. How we do that is that when the server has spawned in that chest, we need to retain that data. So we're going to get chest number 46. And if it has seven items, it will have seven content IDs that are specific to that chest, each with a dictionary holding the data of the particular item that that content ID represents. Now, back to the client, when we actually loot that chest, we only need that client to send the server two ID numbers. The first ID number being the chest ID, 46, and the second ID number being the content ID, maybe number five. Then when the server receives those two ID numbers, it needs to do two things. First off, it's a proximity test because we want to make sure that the client is not spoofing the server into thinking that it's loading a chest tens of kilometers away. So based on the positional data of that chest, which we can verify against the positional data of the client or that player based off of the latest snapshot from our movement synchronization function, we can check if that client is actually close enough to this chest to be indeed looted. And then if that turns out, we take the particular item which content ID number five represents and we put that into the inventory of the player on the server so that next time when the client is requesting its inventory to open up, we can load that item into the inventory and show the player the actual item it has looted. Okay, that was it for me guys, that was my talk. I hope that this has been insightful, both in the terminology regarding multiplayer games, the various elements that can go into it, and the considerations that surround it. If you wanna know more, check out my YouTube channel. There has a six hour plus course on there, Game Development Center. I should also be in a chat here somewhere, left or right of the screen, but I'm probably already participating. Feel free to ask some questions. I think we got a couple of minutes left for that. Then all that's left for me is to wish you a very pleasant continuation of this GoDotCon 2021. I hope to see you face to face in GoDot 2022 when the world is back to normal. Until then, keep on gaming, keep on coding. See you later, guys.